If you've bought a new smartphone in the last couple of years, you may well have noticed that it's quite a bit smarter and more capable than the models of just a few years earlier. Now, some might put this down to the CPUs, memory and general computer hardware becoming faster, but that doesn't explain the huge performance increase that now allow features like Face ID to verify it's you and unlock your device in under a second, far more accurate voice recognition, automatic text identification and translation using your camera, smart HDR for pictures and videos, and yes, even Animojis, plus a whole lot more. This is following a trend in which we will see a great deal more of the devices which we use every day becoming a lot smarter. This has all happened in the last couple of years with the convergence of neural network engines, machine learning software, and the data to train them on, which has become now more widely available. This is how the smartphone in your pocket is helping lead the way in intelligent machines. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan is a new documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that have a passion for their work. Magellan believes that spreading knowledge about human endeavors is key, and their mission is to tell great stories and show how we got to where we are today. With over 3,000 documentaries available, and with more being added all the time, and a wide selection of those being in 4K, Magellan is a place to find a huge range of documentaries ready to stream directly to your viewing device, be that fixed or mobile. To complement our video today, Magellan has a very thought-provoking documentary called AI vs. Human Brain, The Final Showdown, about the advances that AI or machine learning has made in the past decade or so, and where it might go in the next decade or so, and what the implications will be for all of us, whether we like it or not. You can watch this and many more. Plus, up until December 31st, 2021, you can take advantage of a special holiday offer buy one annual membership and get another for free by clicking on the link in the description below and I'm sure you'll enjoy watching Magellan TV as much as I have. If you think about it, a smartphone has got to be one of the more awkward computing devices to use. You only have a small screen that has to double up as a keyboard and a mouse, not ideal for those with sausage fingers and dodgy eyesight, and yet you now carry around the power of a desktop computer in your pocket. So to make these devices easier for everyone to use and get a competitive advantage over rivals, the search has been on to make these devices work for us humans, including the older ones like me, and work in ways that are seamless and as natural as possible. So there'll be more talking to your phone and less tapping on the screen. Now this sounds like it might be an easy task for today's powerful processors, but talking to and interacting with a machine like we would another human is an incredibly difficult task for a traditional computer. If you take voice recognition, for example, everyone speaks differently, some fast, some slow, and then there's a widely varying accents for each language. 10 years or so ago, dictation software required that you read several paragraphs of text to train it to just your voice. And even then the results weren't that good. Today, with the latest devices, you can just talk to your phone and it will create a very accurate text transcription with few errors and no training. So what has changed to allow these newfound capabilities? Well, if you've seen any of the recent marketing blurb, you may well have noticed a lot of things like multi-core neural engines and machine AI are getting a lot more mentions. Apple used the term neural engine, Google has its Tensor engine, Samsung has its neural processing unit, and Huawei has its Kirin chipset, but basically these are chips specifically designed to run neural network software. Although the term AI or artificial intelligence is used, this is machine learning. So what's the difference? According to computer scientist and philosopher Judea Pearl in his book, The Book of Why, machine learning learns and predicts based on passive observations, whereas artificial intelligence implies an agent interacting with the environment to learn and take actions that maximize the chance of achieving its goals. So what's the difference between that and a normal computer? Well, in a normal computer program, a programmer 
has to define what the program is required to do ahead of time and then program all the possible responses it will have depending upon the inputs it receives. If an input deviates from the expected, the system cannot change itself to allow for that. It's effectively a dumb system following a precise set of instructions exactly. But sometimes there are circumstances where every possible variation cannot be programmed ahead of time, like pattern recognition for images and sounds, things that us humans and our biological neural brains are very good at. Machine learning, on the other hand, is a computer system or a model of a process. It's like a computer program, but one that can learn and adapt without following explicit instructions. So for example, a handwriting recognition model could be trained to recognize any legible characters by analyzing thousands of real world examples and tuning itself to provide the optimum performance that could equal that of a human. Normal computer CPUs process information in a serial fashion, dealing with one block of data, usually eight, 16 or 32 bits at a time, but doing this very, very quickly, billions of times a second. Adding more CPU cores increases the amount of data that can be processed. However, with the current software, there comes a point where adding more cores decreases the efficiency of each one. So a 64 core processor is overall much less efficient from a data through point point of view than an eight core processor and is nowhere near the eight times the computing power that you would think. A neural network works very differently and these are parallel computing engines which work like a collection of connected neurons in a biological brain. In a normal computer, the basic operational element is a gate which performs a Boolean logical operation on its inputs which are either one or zero and provide an output which is either a one or a zero. A neural network uses artificial neurons and much like their biological counterparts, they work in a very different way. So let's have a look at an artificial neuron. It can have a number of inputs, each one with a value between zero and one rather than just the zero and one of a logic gate. Each input also has a weighting value associated with it, which can also be between zero and one and a single overall bias value also between zero and one, which is added to the output. The output then goes through an activation function. This scales the output. So large changes are scaled down and small ones scaled up. The weighting value assigned to each input is multiplied by the input value and determines how important the input is in affecting the neuron's output value. And it is this and the bias values that allow the neural network to learn without having a specifically programmed action. Because we're still dealing with digital chips, each neuron is like a little program which can run on the cores of highly parallel GPUs or similar dedicated chips. So thousands of them can run at the same time and make it extremely quick. Back in 1983, researchers constructed a neural model to recognize handwritten numbers from zero to nine using a 28 by 28 pixel grid and some 60,000 images of handwritten numbers taken from the US Census Bureau employees. These images were anti-aligned, so their edges were smoothed with grayscale shading. So each pixel could have varying values depending upon where the character appeared on the grid and how bright or dark the pixels were. In this model, there are three layers. In the first, there are 784 neurons, one for each pixel of the 28 by 28 grid. Only a few are shown here to simplify the image. Each input neuron measures the value of the pixel with 0.0, .0 representing white and 1.0 representing black with grayscale values in between. The outputs of the 784 neurons feed a second hidden layer of 15 neurons, which then in turn feeds 10 output neurons of the third layer, which represent the output of the network. So when the model is shown a number two, for example, then output two should be close to one and the rest close to zero. If a six were shown, then output six would be close to one and the rest close to zero. This model has 809 neurons in three layers, 
Together with the weighting values of each input and bias values, it has a total of 11,935 parameters that can be adjusted. To train the network, the 11,935 weight and bias parameters are set to random values. Then a character image is shown to the network. In this case, it's a five. If the network is correctly calibrated, then the output five should be close to one and the others close to zero. However, if say number eight was set to 0.7, then it would show that the weighting values for eight need to be reduced and the values for five need to be increased. Once this is done, it then moves on to the next number image. This is how the neural network learns. During the training, when the outputs don't correspond with a known input, the weighting values and bias values are adjusted up or down over successive attempts, which could be thousands or millions of times in more sophisticated models in a method which is called hill climbing until the outputs reach an optimum detection performance. This is where it's said to have reached the top of the hill or the most accurate guess. Using this method, any conceivable mathematical equation could be modeled. However, these could also be called probability engines because the output is the probability of what the network thinks is compared to the input. This also means they are less accurate for high precision mathematical models than traditional computers, although this is increasing as time goes by and models and techniques are developed and refined. Since 1983, when this deep learning method was developed, artificial neural networks have become far more sophisticated. But in 2012, a breakthrough with a deep learning network was made for the annual ImageNet competition organized by Stanford University. In this, entrants were given a set of over a million training images, each labeled with over a thousand categories like articulated truck, cruise liner, lion, sunflower. The winner would be the one who could correctly classify another set of images that were not part of the training set. The models could make five best guesses which would then be matched up against the human labeled images. The winner was a system called AlexNet after the lead author, Alex Krasniewski. Normally, the best error rate during the competition was about 26%, but AlexNet beat them all with an error rate of just 16%. To compare it to the handwriting network, which had three layers, 809 neurons and just under 12,000 parameters, AlexNet had eight layers, 650,000 neurons and 60 million parameters. However, the interesting thing was that it ran across two NVIDIA GTX 580 graphics cards, each with 512 cores, giving the model much more parallel processing power than compared to a normal CPU. Even with this and a lot of optimization, it still took six days to train the model, but the results were pretty good. Since then, deep learning networks or convolutional networks, which AlexNet was, have evolved rapidly with models having tens of layers, millions of neurons and billions of adjustable parameters. With this huge amount of matrix calculations, you can see why they need the parallel processing power of usually multiple GPUs, which are also becoming more powerful each year. By 2017, the best ImageNet competitors had error rates of less than 3% and better than most humans. And this is where we are today. Smartphones make the perfect partner for neural networks powered by custom GPUs, which are now appearing as standard fare in nearly all the high-end smartphones and tasked with doing the fuzzy edge things like image and speech recognition, text and language translation, video and image optimization and manipulation, augmented reality, and a host of other things that bolster the traditional computing CPUs and make the devices not only faster, but also easier to use and also do tasks which would normally have been done by humans. This is something which will spread. The new Apple M1 Macs and MacBooks use an additional 16 core neural engine. So we can expect to see these being integrated into future CPUs from Intel and AMD at some point. 
Machine learning is already being used in many areas, not only by the big tech companies like Google and Facebook, but in other fields as far apart as medicine to finance and almost everything else in between, including things like self-driving cars. But using their vast amounts of user data for training machine learning systems, companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon have opened up another can of worms over privacy. And only recently, Facebook had to shut down their face recognition program and delete the face data from over a billion users because of this very issue. Keeping machine learning data and running the neural networks on the mobile devices and not using online servers to run the neural networks and hold the data like Google and Facebook, Apple say they can avoid these issues. But it looks like it will transform the future of home and mobile computing. And although it won't be able to take over the world, it will certainly change it. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then please thumbs up, subscribe, and share. And don't forget that Patreon supporters get ad-free versions of the videos before they are released on YouTube.